Good evening and welcome back to SF Commons. Tonight we will examine the state of our prison system. The numbers are quite staggering. Some might even say beyond comprehension. The U.S. has 2.3 million prisoners in our systems. The largest number of prisoners in the whole world. 76% are not even convicted. There are 731,000 prisoners in jails today, of which 76% are not convicted or sentenced. In the federal prison system, the vast majority of prisoners are there for drug-related offenses. In the state and local jails, drug possession represents a big portion of the jails. In the local jails, the big scandal is the churn rate. There are 10.6 million people who get admitted to jail every year. And why is that? Tonight, we will examine and show you where all these numbers are and ask the question why if you look at all the people in jail, most of them are poor, minority, men, and women. We are so delighted to have with us tonight to talk about the state of our prison system, the editor-in-chief and senior columnist for the Black Agenda Report, Margaret Kimberly. Hi, Margaret. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's a pleasure. How did the, the most wealthy nation in the world have the most prisoners worldwide? Yes. Um, you, the, the big problem with uh, mass incarceration in the United States is racism. Uh, we started out with a, a country built on the settler colonial state, built on the... Um, uh, genocide against the indigenous people and the enslavement of Africans. So for the first uh, 200 years after Europeans arrived here, black people were enslaved. Uh, after the Civil War, when that uh, finally ended, uh, uh, chattel slavery ended legally, there were a variety of systems which um, uh, were dedicated to keeping black people under physical control. So there's mm -hmm. no more slavery, but then you have a convict labor system throughout mostly Southern states, and black people could be snatched up at any time and uh, be forced to uh, uh, work on chain gangs, uh, mostly in the South, but not exclusively. And uh, after the Civil War, there's another problem at which we still have, and that's the 13th Amendment, which ended uh, slavery, but made an exception for people who were convicted of crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a, a different sort of uh, prison labor system now. So um, these were followed by uh, 100 years of, of segregation, where uh, segregation was legal. And in the 60s, because of the, the liberation movement, which uh, 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 black people uh, directed, a self-directed mass movement, the system had a problem, uh, wherein now you had these people who were controlled um, um, legally. It could be determined where they could live, where they could work. Discrimination was perfectly legal. And at that point, that is when the problem started. I, I recently discovered that in 1968, when Martin Luther King, shortly before he was killed, there were only 300,000 people total 
oh, in really? the country who were incarcerated, just 300,000. And now, as you just said, it's more than 2 million. 2.3 million. Yeah, and this, um, uh, so each, uh, as time went by, the need to find a replacement for segregation in, uh, increased. So there were wars on drugs. So Nixon starts with the war on drugs. Uh, Reagan has a war on drugs. Uh, Clinton has a war on drugs. Then we're told they, they always want to panic people. It was heroin. It was opium. It was, then it was the crack epidemic. I'm not saying there were not problems with the legal drug use and importation and the impact on communities, mostly, I think, because they were criminalized. Right. But this was always, these were always used as excuses to put more black people in jail Crack, um, crack cocaine, which is just a cocaine in another form where you smoke it instead of snort it. Um, we were told that this uh, epidemic uh, called for more punitive measures. So people who trafficked in coca cocaine and crack po form, mostly black people, were given much harsher sentences than white people who generally used it in the powder form. So we were told that this same drug was so much more dangerous that we had to have these draconian sentences. Uh, there are people still in jail. And every time uh, these laws were debated, we would be assured that it wouldn't be the little drug user or the little drug dealer, or it would, but it would be the kingpin, so to speak. But that never happened. It was just a dragnet of millions of, uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, of the two, more than two million people in prison, half are black. Black people are uh, roughly 13% of the population, but 50% of all those who are incarcerated. Um, and the United States incarcerates so many people that uh, uh, one in four prisoners on the planet is a black American. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's where, uh, that's a sh short uh, version of how we ended up where we are now. Well, what do you think about the crime bill? Joe Biden yes. authored the, the crime bill. Unless we do something about that cadre of young people, tens of thousands of them, born out of wedlock, without parents, without supervision, without any structure, without any conscience developing, because they literally, I yield myself three more minutes, because they literally have not been socialized. They literally have not had an opportunity. We should focus on them now, not out of a liberal instinct for love, brother, and humanity, although I think that's a good instinct, but for simple, pragmatic reasons. If we don't, they will, or a portion of them will, become the predators 15 years from now. And Madam President, we have predators on our streets that society has, in fact, in part because of its neglect, created. Again, it does not mean because we created them that we somehow forgive them or do not take them out of society to protect my family and yours from them. They are beyond the pale, many of those people. Beyond the pale. And it's a sad commentary on society. We have no choice but to take them out of society. I, I knew he was, uh, he was a senator then in 1994, um, a very um, senator with seniority, a prominent, uh, powerful member of the Senate. And he, part of his speech, it was incredible. He never said the word black people, but he used all the code words, uh, children born out of wedlock. Right. Um, that uh, they were unsocialized, that they were predators, uh, that they had to be kept away from the rest of us, that they were so dangerous, these young people, uh, that our safety depended on uh, keeping them away from us. And of course, he meant black people. And so 25 years later, here he is running for president. And uh, I'm glad that we have the record of statements like that from him, from Bill Clinton, from Hillary Clinton. Uh, and it's, it's especially shameful because, uh, you know, black people are mostly Democrats. Uh, we want to, and it's understandable, our desire is always to keep Republicans out of office, but we've allowed Democrats to do things to us that are, are terrible. Uh, so the federal prison system, there was a huge increase 
in uh, the incarceration rate during the Bill uh, Clinton administration. And I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit it now, but I still voted for him. Uh, this was 94, that was after his uh, first, um, during his first term, but he ran again in 96 and I voted for him and 90% of black people still voted for him. And I, I think that's also because crime was a problem and people were suffering. But um, uh, we were whipped into a state of hysteria. Uh, we were painted as the culprits. And uh, a combination of uh, those factors and the fact that we always believe that we have no choice other than to support the Democrats, we uh, sadly went along uh, with those things. But it wasn't just Biden who made these racist statements. Hillary Clinton uh, did too. She, when she was running for president three years ago, she was trying to live it down and say mass incarceration, you know, that era should be over. Um, and largely she got away with being that such a double talker. But uh, uh, so yes, that's where Biden stood and that's where most Democrats stood. The, the act itself is called the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, which Biden authored in 1994. This particular legislation really created the most impact and just an explosion of mass incarceration for women, men, poor, and minorities. Well, it's, uh, this bill is a, is a federal bill but uh, so it impacted mostly um, uh, crimes prosecuted in federal court, but it tracked with local and state governments as well. This was a, a phenomenon that was happening across the country, uh, across various states and cities. Uh, so the um, Clinton led the way though. This uh, governor, Mario Cuomo, used money that was supposed to be used, federal housing money, um, for, and I guess he was housing low-income people, but um, the number of prisons quadrupled in, uh, in the state of New York. So it wasn't just the federal government. It wasn't just the crime bill in uh, Washington, but this is something that was happening uh, all over the, the country. And it all sounded good. Nobody likes crime. Nobody wants right. to be a victim of crime. Uh, so it also it panders to people's worst um, and and it's, it's interesting because black people wanted their neighborhoods to be safer and wanted to get drug dealing and, and other um, activities out of uh, their neighborhoods. But this response, this super punitive response made things uh, far worse. Uh, the sentences were so long. P judges were, um, uh, there were mandatory minimums, which are horrible. Um, you know, we were always told, it's so interesting, the propaganda that we were given. We were always told about lenient judges who let people out, and they'd always find the worst case scenario to, to uh, tell us about. Uh, so everybody got hit with the, the same sentences. Right. Uh, judges should have discretion. When judges don't have discretion, it's especially bad for black people. Um, and for judges to be taken out of uh, the equation and for everyone to be treated the same, to be treated very harshly and equally harshly, um, serve to disrupt the community. In public housing, for example, if you were convicted of a, 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 a crime, you couldn't live in public housing. So people couldn't even live with their own families. Um, so uh, the effects of this were quite terrible. People couldn't get student loans. If you were convicted of a drug offense, you couldn't get a student loan, ever. Uh, so people were uh, punished for the rest of their uh, lives. And it was quite devastating. And uh, we also don't talk about the fact that um, a lot of this criminality, drugs come from outside of the United States. So there are people far more powerful than uh, black Americans who could have uh, stopped this uh, scourge and when Reagan was president and right. Reagan was leading this campaign, just say no to drugs and everything was bad. Marijuana was as bad as heroin was bad as, you know, anything else. As the gateway, we're told it was a gateway drug. Biden is still talking about marijuana as a gateway drug. So it's still, marijuana is still in the federal list of substances, of prohibited substances. I would, and I think it's going to be a problem for many other people as well. 
What, what do you think about the privata privatization of prison? When the war on drugs started and the crime bill of 1994 and there's this explosion, suddenly there's overcrowding in the prison system and then there's a mandate for states to build new prisons because of the, the lack of space. And so the government looked to the private sector to provide prisons. And there are two major prison companies funded by Wall Street. Their investors are like Wells Fargo Bank, Vanguard. There is no proof that they had, in fact, lowered the cost of imprisonment. There, there's a problem with the... Uh obviously a profit. Everything's been commodified now, so human beings are being commodified. So uh, it was inevitable that the private sector would find it a way to make a profit off of uh, human bodies, uh, disproportionately black bodies. Uh, so of course, um, uh, large uh, banks and other interests that you mentioned are, are making profit. Uh, this is uh, something uh, that's it's part of a larger trend of government uh, activities, government services being privatized. So, uh, why not prisons? The food, food stamps, for example, there's only one state that administers its own food stamp program. Uh, poor people are a profit center, and uh, incarceration is no uh, exception. So obviously, there's a profit motive in putting people in jail. Uh, no one's going to go into a business where, where they aren't going to make profit. So this just uh, gives an incentive. And um, so that's quite awful. But I, I think it's it's time also to think about the uh, idea of incarceration itself. And there is a prison abolition movement, which I think should be studied very seriously. Um, we, uh, as a nation, need to think about uh, seriously uh, decreasing the number of people behind bars, this is the only country where there are people serving life sentences who didn't even commit violent offenses. Exactly. It strikes laws. If you commit three felonies, you can be sentenced to uh, life in prison. Uh, so we have we have juveniles, people sentenced as juveniles serving life sentences. And, you know, for countries that um, we always call ourselves an advanced nation, the developed world, the civilized world. Uh, this is the only country that does that sort of thing. But race is the driving factor. And I, I don't think we can have serious discussions about um, uh, prison uh, abolition uh, without talking about uh, racism. This has become, and it's, and it's part of a very, uh, uh, it's, it's very sinister. We have a system now that produces fewer living wage jobs. Uh, in the 60s or 70s, there were, um, even up to a couple decades ago, uh, black people could make a living, uh, even people without education or training. There were living wage jobs for people. Uh, but um, the uh, hyper-capitalized uh, world, finance capital, did away with that. So you have millions of people who can't earn a uh, living um, uh, income so you have, uh, so these two needs meet. You have a system which wants uh, to do something with millions, instead of providing for them, instead of assisting them, instead of providing a universal basic income, the solution is to put them, uh, put them all away. Um, not only do you have prisons that are run by private corporations, but prisoners in many states are required to work. In some cases, they're paid just pennies. In some cases, they're not paid at all. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me begin with a profound remark. Society which neglects, which oppresses, and which disdains a very significant part of its population, which leaves them hungry, impoverished, unemployed, uneducated, and utterly without hope, will, through cause and effect, create a population which is bitter, which is angry, which is violent, and a society which is crime-ridden. And that is the case in America, and it is the case in other countries throughout the world. Mr. Chairman, how do we talk about the very serious crime problem in America without mentioning 
without mentioning that we have the highest rate of childhood poverty in the industrialized world by far, with 22 percent of our children in poverty and five million kids hungry today. Do you think maybe that might have some relationship to crime? How do we talk about crime when this Congress is prepared this year to spend 11 times more for the military than for education? When 21 percent of our kids drop out of high school, when a recent study told us that twice as many young workers now earn poverty wages as 10 years ago, when the gap between the rich and the poor is growing wider, and when the rate of poverty continues to grow. Do you think maybe that might have some relationship to crime? Mr. Chairman, it is my firm belief that clearly there are people in our society who are horribly violent, who are deeply sick and sociopathic, and clearly these people must be put behind bars in order to protect society from them. But it is also my view that through the neglect of our government and through a grossly irrational set of priorities, we are dooming today tens of millions of young people to a future of bitterness, misery, hopelessness, drugs, crime, and violence. And, Mr. Speaker, all the jails in the world, and we already imprison more people per capita than any other country. And all of the executions, all the jails in the world, and all will not make that situation right. We can either educate or electrocute, we can create meaningful jobs, rebuilding our society, or we can build more jails. Mr. Speaker, let us create a society of hope and compassion, not one of hate and vengeance. In terms of where people want to go today, you ask us 2.3 million people in prison. It's just not tenable, right? What kind of society is that? That needs to be a, a political demand, and I think we need to just come out and say it. The prison population can can go back to where it was 50 years ago, when it was only 300,000 people. There's no reason why it can't. There has to be... It's a business, and it's not right. just um, uh, private uh, uh, prison corporations, but here, for example, um, there are parts of New York State where they depend on jobs in prison. There are places upstate that have no industry. That's where most of the big prisons are. And you have entire communities where the biggest employer is, um, is the state prison system. Uh, people are taken out of their communities. They're counted in the census. They're counted as residents of these little towns that wouldn't have anybody. So uh, you have a system where some people get employment, uh, some areas of the country uh, benefit from having more people. There are there are the, the corporations where prisons um, uh, make money for uh, for large businesses. Even Whole Foods, I remember there was a scandal where it turned out there a lot of their dairy products were came from a, a prison uh, farm. We have to look at dismantle this 1994 crime bill. Uh, so there, there has to be a, a discussion about getting rid of this, but that will mean having a larger discussion about race, uh, about the kind of country we have, where there are millions of people who don't have jobs, where the prison system has become uh, an employer uh, for some people and a place of slave labor for other people. They privatize child support collections, so... Once again, poverty is a, a profit center for the nation, but I think there needs to be a wholesale, hard look at everything that, um, uh, all the crimes, what the sentences are, and there needs to be an emphasis on, it needs to be a decision to let people out of jail, to stop incarcerating people, to get rid of a three strikes law. Anybody in prison because of their third strike should be out of prison. And that's where the way we have to have this, uh, this conversation. Thank you for joining us again. See you next time. Good night.